First of all, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, please. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. And when you come to Luke 24, come down to verse number 45, please. Luke chapter 24, verse 45. Then he, the Lord Jesus, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. You know, if you want to know and understand the Scriptures this morning, just you ask the Lord. And he said unto them in verse 46, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Beth to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. And then the Acts of the Apostles, please. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. I'm beginning to read at verse number 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken, spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And we know that the Lord will add His blessing to the reading of His own precious truth. The great promise the Lord Jesus made before He went to the cross was this great promise. It's the promise that every believer, every believer should live in the light of. Do you remember how the Lord Jesus spoke to those downcast disciples when he said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, now here's the promise, I will come again. 
and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. You know, four words this morning makes that great promise. I will come again. Do you know, that's a promise that is yet to be fulfilled. It's a promise that is the next prophetical event to take place on the calendar of God. I will come again. And every believer, every one of us, should live in the light of that promise. And this morning, dear unsaved friend, if you're not saved this morning, and the Lord Jesus was to come, and he could come, before this service ends, every truly saved, born-again believer will suddenly disappear from this tabernacle, leaving behind us our personal belongings. And you'll be left behind. And when you see this morning all that's going on in our world today, and you see the unrest that's taking place in the, in the nation of Europe, oh, dear friend, there's nothing more stares us in the face today than the great text, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And dear unsaved friend, do you know what the Lord Jesus says? It'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than it will be for you if you're left behind in this world. Sinners will seek the Lord, you know. But they'll be seeking Him just one day too late. And the Lord Jesus is coming, dear unsaved friend. And in an hour, that ye think not the Son of Man cometh. What did the Lord Jesus say? In that day and in that hour. And be ye also ready, for in an hour that ye know not the Son of Man cometh. Listen, Jesus is coming again, so be ready for when he comes. You need to repent of sin and get repentance of any old silly notion that you're good enough. You need to believe you're a sinner to, today. And you need to believe this morning that Christ died for you and accept him and receive him into your heart because if he was to come today and you're not saved, we're going but you're staying. For he that will come shall come and will not tarry. And that's a promise this morning, not only that should strike the fear of God into the heart of the unsaved, it's a promise that should make every believer to live in its light. The promise that every believer should live in the light of. The final promise the Lord Jesus made before he went to heaven is another great promise. Another great promise that has been fulfilled, not for every believer to live in the light of, but for every believer to live in the power of. Yes for every believer to, lay, to live in the power of. I wonder, child of God, do you ever get frustrated with your Christian life? Do you ever say to yourself this morning, what is lacking in my Christian life? Do you ever ask yourself this morning, what is missing in my Christian life? What is the longing of my Christian life? What is the great need for my Christian life to make my Christian life a real difference? It's so sad how many Christians today live powerless and paralyzed lives 
Their Christian life is one of defeat. Their Christian life seems to be one of failure rather than one of victory. And listen, child of God, I'm not condemning any person because there go any of us but for the grace of God. But why is it, child of God, so many of God's people today, their lives are deflated. Their Christian lives have no impact on themselves, never mind impact on others. Dear child of God, what is the great need for the hour? What is the great need for the day? in which we live. Here's a wee question the Lord has laid upon my heart just at this moment. What are you willing to pay? What price are you willing to pay to have the touch of God upon your life? Because that's what we all need. We all need this morning a touch of God upon our life. What is it, perhaps, child of God? What is it you have to deal with? What is it I have to deal with this morning in our own lives so that the power of God may rest upon these lives of ours? Because, child of God, to live these Christian lives of ours, we need the power of God to rest upon us. It's not a life to be lived in the life of the flesh. How many of us this morning, child of God, are instead of being filled with divine energy, we're filled with human weakness. Child of God, what do you lack? What do I lack? What do we need? So many today are like Lazarus. No doubt they're saved. Lazarus was miraculously brought out of the tomb, made alive, but he came out bound head and foot. He had had life, but he had no liberty. You know, so many Christians, you know, and we can live like that. We have life, but with no liberty. We're bound from head to foot, perhaps, with public opinion. We're bound head to foot with perhaps some sinful habit that we fail to turn from. We don't enjoy the liberty that we are meant to enjoy. How many of us are like Peter? Man, we're so filled with fire and brimstone one moment, one moment, and then we're like a damp squid the next day. Child of God, what is lacking? My text declares this morning the need for the hour. It's the need for today. And it's a text the Lord burned and branded upon my heart and upon my soul and upon my mind. And it's a text the Lord had for my heart, my heart alone before this was for you. My text this morning is Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. It's verse 8. Acts 1, verse 8. Here's the promise the Lord Jesus made before he went to heaven. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Do you know that's the last promise the Lord Jesus made before He went to heaven? 
And that's the promise that every child of God needs to live in the power of. I want you to notice, first of all, in that text, there is the promise of Holy Ghost power. Because Holy Ghost power is what's lacking today. Holy Ghost power in the church. Holy Ghost power in the individual Christian life. That's what's needed. Do you have Holy Ghost power in your life, sister? Have you got the Holy Ghost power in your life, brother? Have I got it in my life? Notice the text, the promise of Holy Ghost power. But ye shall receive power. I want you to notice something about that text this morning, and it teaches me this. Before Christ could send the church into the world, Christ had to send the Holy Ghost into the church first to fulfill and to function properly as it should. I'm going to repeat that. Before Christ could send the church into the world, he had to send the Holy Ghost into the church in order for the church to function and for the church to fulfill its mission. You know, child of God, this morning, that's what's needed in all of our lives this morning. You know, you and I cannot function properly and you and I cannot fulfill our mission properly this morning without the power of the Holy Ghost. And what's lacking today? You know, I was, William John and me were at the council meeting a number of weeks ago, the Baptist Association, and they were telling us that there's Baptist churches closing in Belfast. They're closing wholesale. But yet they were telling us what they need. They want men into the college to teach them and to train them and to turn them into graduates and all the rest of it. Listen, it's not graduates we need in our pulpits today. We need young men whose hearts the Lord has touched. That's the need for today. We don't need sloppy sermons. We don't need, this is the day, friend, like every other day. We don't need men, young men, or any kind of men getting up and giving us lovely lectures. We need young men whose hearts the Lord has touched, whose hearts are on fire with God. Young men who are filled with the Holy Ghost and of power, who spend time in the presence of God, bringing the message of God. One man said to me recently, we are sick and tired of lifeless messages. And this is what he said that come from Google. The need of the early church was the power of the Holy Ghost upon men. It's the need for today's church, child of God. Young men, men of all sorts, who are filled with the power of God, the Holy Ghost. It's not lecturers we need. Men filled with the power of God, the Holy Ghost. And friend, if it was the need for the early church, sure, is it not the need for today's church? Listen, child of God, if that was the need for the early Christians, how more should it not be the need for today's Christian? That's what's lacking in all of our life. Holy Ghost power. See, it's Spurgeon during the early days of his ministry. 
before he was even a pastor, bought himself a penny-farthing bicycle. I don't think there's anybody old enough here to know a penny. I've been kind to you now. He bought himself a penny-farthing bicycle, silver plated man. He was proud of it. He took it out for a spin one day. He was riding down the street, and this fellow came up with a bone shaker. Now, I don't remember the bone shaker. The bone shaker. And see, it's Spurgeon looked over him. He says, hey, boy, you'll not get any far. You'll not get far fast on that machine you're on. And the man shouts over to the young Spurgeon. He says, try me. And see, it's Spurgeon tried to keep up with him in his penny farthing bicycle. And here, this boy was in a bone shaker, and he couldn't keep up with him. And Spurgeon says, God spoke to him. He says, Spurgeon, you have the machine. He has the power. You have the machine. He has the power. He hasn't much as far as the machine is concerned, but he has the most important, the power. What you and I need today, child of God, is the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives. It's the one thing I need in my life. It's the one thing I long for. It's the one thing I need. I believe today churches are lifeless. Many churches are lifeless. Many preachers are lifeless. Many Christians are lifeless because of the lack of power. The promise of the Holy Ghost. Then I want you to look secondly at that text again because you've got the presence of the Holy Ghost, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Many are confused at that phrase, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I want to say something now, child of God, and I want to put this straight. Some people teach in what is known as the second blessing. You need the second experience to receive the Holy Ghost. Let me make this clear. The moment you believe, the moment you were born again, the moment your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you were baptized of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit at this moment indwells you now, brother, and it dwells in you now, sister. Know ye not, Paul had to say that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, that you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Child of God, the, promise, the, the problem is this morning, it's not that we don't have His presence. The problem is we don't have His power. Why do we not enjoy the power of God, the Holy Ghost, in our lives? Listen, I was at a mission one. I was conducting a mission in a place a number of years ago. And as we were in the prayer room, some brother prayed this prayer, Lord, we need another Pentecost. And I cringed at that. Praying we need another Pentecost is like praying we need another Calvary. I don't think he knew what he was talking about when he prayed that. The Pentecost that was given in Acts chapter 2 is a once and for all experience when God sent His Holy Spirit into the world to indwell every believer. Listen, child of God, there's no point in praying for the Holy Ghost to come. He's here! 
The Holy Ghost is in the world because the Holy Ghost is in you, child of God, and he's in me. The problem doesn't lie with the Holy Spirit. The problem lies with you. The problem lies with me. What is the problem of the church today? Do you know why I had a pastor on with me this week in a terrible way? You know what the problem was? He shared with me some of the problems that's going on within his church. The fighting, the bitterness. And he says, George, this is why we're not enjoying blessing. And you know, child of God, listen this morning. When we live contrary to the Word of God, we are closing the door on Holy Ghost power in our lives. He guides us into all the truth, we're told. And if the Holy Spirit of God guides us into the truth and we decide not to live by the truth, then we're quenching the Spirit and we're grieving the Spirit. Disobedience is what deflates the power of God the Holy Ghost in a believer's life. Disobedience. You remember it was disobedience that robbed Saul of the kingdom. You remember it was disobedience that brought Israel to defeat many times. But listen, child of God, what fuels, what fuels the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives? I'll tell you what it fuels, as God showed me. It's obedience and submission to the Word of God. Obedience is what puts the key in the door, and praying in the will of God unlocks the key for Holy Ghost power. D.L. Moody was asked the question, Mr. Moody, Mr. Moody, what is the key to have Holy Ghost power as to what you enjoy? He says obedience to the Word of God. Charles Finney, the great revivalist, was once asked, Mr. Finney, what's the secret of Holy Ghost power in your life? Obedience to the Word of God, he answered. John Wesley in his day was asked the very same question, and the very same answer came, obedience to the Word of God. I'm sure one of the greatest preachers our wee province ever knew, and some of you knew him, I never knew him, he was long gone before I was born, it was W.P. Nicholson. W.P. Nicholson was asked, what was the secret behind his ministry? W.P. Nicholson had a mission in the Harlan Wolf shipyard. And so great was the response. They actually had to build a shed for men to put tools that they had stolen from the shipyard to return them. So great was the convicting power of God the Holy Ghost upon his ministry. That's what had to happen. They had to build a shade to store the stolen tools that were returned. One asked the great preacher this question, the very same question. Here's his answer, I quote. Submitting to the authority of God's Word, not only acknowledging its truthfulness, but by walking in obedience to that truth it teaches. Child of God, the early church was not educated. The early Christians were not heirs in grace. The early Christians were people who were filled with the Holy Ghost because the Scripture says they were all in unity and in obedience. Tell me this, child of God, are you lacking for Holy Ghost power in your life? There's the promise of Holy Ghost power. There's the presence of Holy Ghost power. I'm finishing. Take a wee look at that text again. There's the purpose of Holy Ghost power. It says there, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be my witnesses. 
Do you know the Holy Ghost wasn't given to the church so that the early Christians could perform miracles? The Holy Ghost was given first and foremost so that they could be a perfect witness for Him. Do you know, child of God, a Christian witness is not what you become. I want to repeat this. A witness for Christ is not what you become. It's what you are the moment you come to Christ. Every one of us who names the name of Christ, you're a witness. Being a witness for Jesus Christ is not, a, it's not just a matter of putting a track in a man's nose and telling him he needs to be saved. Being a witness for Jesus Christ is your life and how it's left. Our brother Marcus, as he was speaking in Slave Row this morning, said this, to be a witness for Jesus Christ is how you live in the classroom at school. To be a witness for Jesus Christ is to be how you drive your car on the road. To be a witness for Jesus Christ is to be the person you are at home. To be a witness for Jesus Christ is being the person where you are. Tell me this, child of God. You're either a good witness or a bad witness. That was the main reason as to why the Holy Ghost was given to the early church to be witnesses for Christ. Billy Graham on his wee daily calendar wrote these words as I turned it over this morning as a confirmation to this message. A life lived has more punch with it than perhaps a sermon preached. With this, I'm going to finish. My uncle James was a man who never went to church, would never have darkened the church door apart from funerals or weddings. Faith mission used to come maybe twice a, every two years. The whole missions, and he used to tell them, listen, what are you coming up around our part of the country to preach for? Sure, we have enough churches in the town without you coming to preach to us. But there's a man called Bert Cooper who lived up the road from us. Many, many years ago, many years ago, my uncle's bailer, the power shaft broke and it wasn't to be ready for the weekend, and rain was to come before the weekend. The bailer was ready. And as my Uncle James came to the field, he noticed something very strange in the field. He noticed that this neighbor of his had the field of hay, the field of hay bailed. And not only did he have the field of hay baled for my Uncle James, but three quarters of the hay was in stooks. My Uncle James never asked him to do it. This man was never a preacher, but he was a well-saved Presbyterian. Many years after that, in 1989, Billy Graham had the, what they called the Live Link in London. And the whole churches in the Ochnachloy area, they wanted to have this all broadcast, etc. This man who bailed my uncle's hay many years prior to this went to my uncle on, on the outreach. And to be honest with you, he went to my uncle's house in fear and trembling. What's this man going to say? And he talked about heaven under the sun, but they ran out of conversation. And my uncle James says, Bert, what, are you, what can I do for you? He said to him, he says, James, you know, we're having a wee bit of a mission in Ochnachloy and we're wondering, would you come? And he handed him the invitation. This is what he said. Saying it's you, Bert, I'll go. Saying it's you, Bert, 
I'll go. And he did go. Now listen, child of God. The way you and I live is the first and foremost witness that we need to proclaim before we give a tract to anybody. Because a lot of Christians, their walk does not match their talk. And the only way we can be a perfect witness for God is to live our lives in accordance to this book, not outside this book, but in this book. And when we live our lives in obedience to God's Word, that is when we will know the power of the Holy Ghost in these lives of ours. Ye shall be my witnesses. And child of God, may we long for the power of God, the Holy Ghost, to be in our lives so that these lives may be lived as a perfect, pure witness for him that will bring glory to his holy name. Amen. Our closing